Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, fabulous. Um, so as Dan said, I'm Marilyn Ritchie. I'm a faculty member at Penn State University, and I'm the PI of the genomics portion of the coordinating, coordinating, coordinating center, and I am a member of the Marshfield team in Emerge, and I've been part of Emerge since it started. Um, I really briefly want to just mention some of the things that the genomics work group and uh, all of the members across the sites have done in terms of genomic discovery. And I will be brief because Rex covered um, many of these in Emerge 1. We did some genotyping. Some sites have started some sequencing. Um, a large bit of emphasis was placed on QC and specifically related to merging the data sets. Um, this is, uh, to, to use Dan's word, unique. Um, this is one of the unique features of Emerge. Rather than focusing on meta-analysis, we've really emphasized mega-analysis and merging the data sets across sites. It's given us a lot more power to detect associations. Um, in Emerge 2, we've spent a great deal of effort on imputation. We've started some GWAS studies, some interaction studies, and others that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so as I mentioned, QC was a major emphasis specifically related to merging data sets. We have multi ethnic groups, we had multiple uh, genotyping platforms in Emerge 2, and a real benefit to Emerge is access to individual level data across the consortium, which is very different from a lot of other consortia. So we've published a number of papers on QC and merging data and, and, and the like. Um, we've done GWAS studies in a number of areas, including binary disease outcomes, as well as continuous values. Um, they have gone on throughout Emerge 1. They've started in Emerge 2 as well. And so um, I think we've had a lot of success in that area, but we want to be able to push new areas of discovery. Um, as we said, in Emerge 2, we've spent a lot of time on imputation, and the, the precipice of this was because we had so many different platforms and we wanted to be able to merge across sites. And in the end, right now, we have a Seed clean version of 51,000 samples. We have several thousand more to include soon. Um, these data have um, anywhere between 8 and 15 million SNPs, depending on what QC criterion you want to use. And so we can use these to do a number of different genome-wide association studies. As Rex mentioned, we've spent some time on this null variance idea. So these are looking for variants that perhaps may be more rare that are predicted to be null, so uh, stop gain variants or uh, you know, lack of start of transcription. And so we did this using a bioinformatics approach, and we've looked at both the genotype sets and the imputed sets to see the occurrence of null variants. And you've already seen this slide, so I won't spend a lot of time, but you know, we wanted to be able to look where are we observing these null variants across the genome. And specifically right now, we're focusing on regions where we see stop gain variants. These are variants that we want to be able to go back to the EMR and do a FEWAS analysis and find, do we have clinical characteristics or traits that are associating with some of these null variants? Um, because they're rare, uh, there are things that may not have been observed much in the literature, but because of the sample size of eMERGE, we may actually have the, the power and ability to find um, such clinical associations. Um, as it was mentioned, we've been embarking on the PGX project, which is really our first sequencing endeavor as a group. These are the 84 pharmacogenes using the platform developed by the PGRN. And uh, the coordinating center has been doing multi-sample uh, variant calling on this set. So far, we have over 2,000 samples that have been sequenced and called as a group. Um, we're doing a lot of different quality control, and we will be embarking on some CWAS and some um, MedWAS or drug wasp association studies with those. And these variants are available currently via SYNC, which is our public repository. Um, so you can search in this site to see uh, the number of variants um, that we have found in each gene for the 2,000 samples so far. So what I want to spend most of the time talking about and to try to drive the discussion is, is what we might do in terms of discovery in eMERGE 3. And, and I did take this discussion to the full genomics work group as well, and so um, some of these ideas are, are coming from the various sites. Um, we think that there's enormous potential for future discoveries in eMERGE, and, and this is um, kind of going off of what's been going on some in the chat room. You know, I don't think we want to necessarily just do more GWAS and find more of the small 
affect variants that, that other consortia are finding. Um, I think you know, one benefit that we have is currently the set of 50,000 samples with shared individual level data, so we don't have to rely on meta-analysis. We can actually do a combined joint analysis of these data. And, and from the earlier slides, it sounds like there is potential to add another 50,000 samples to this um, over the, the next year of the grant. Um, many other consortia are only sharing summary statistics. And as we just talked about, the EHR enables vast potential for phenotyping. And there are a lot of things that we haven't done a lot of in eMERGE yet. And part of this is just, you know, it takes a lot of time. It took a lot of time to get the data imputed and merged and clean. Now we're ready to do analysis. The phenotyping also takes time. But because of the EHR, we can start to think about treatment outcomes. We could do disease subsets based on different clinical characteristics. You know, because of the EHR, there are different features of disease that we could start to think about in terms of subphenotyping or endophenotyping, which I've participated in a lot of GWAS consortia. Often we don't have those other traits captured on samples to do that. Um, extreme phenotypes is an area that is gaining popularity, especially when thinking about rare variants. We can do things about direction of causality because we have the data over time. And, and a big thing that's come up a lot is this idea of doing longitudinal GWAS. You know, every time we present in meetings about eMERGE, we tout how, how we have this strong EMR and longitudinal data and how we can use that as an advantage in our association studies. Yet, for the most part, we haven't really exploited that. We've only started to uh, scratch the surface on what we could do. Um, so in addition to just those types of analyses, I think there's a lot more that can be mined out of the data that we have. And, and there's a list here, and so I'll just I'll talk about some of them briefly. Um, we do have a, a highly multi-ethnic set um, included in eMERGE, and so we have the opportunity to look at racial or ancestral disparities in, in allele frequency for uh, important variants in addition to um, disease disparities. We know that there are certain traits um, where we see disparity based on race, ethnicity, ethnicity, and that is something that we could start to explore in much more detail than we've done. Um, structural variants or CNVs, this is something that we've really just started. Um, David Crossland and his group has led an effort to call CNVs in the eMERGE 1 data set because we had the raw data such that CNV calls could be made. Um, as part of eMERGE 2, on the last genomics workgroup call, we discussed getting those raw files from all of the eMERGE 2 sites so that we could call CNVs broadly across the network. Um, a lot of work has been coming out late, lately looking at um, the burden of CNVs across the genome. And um, there are different ways that that could be calculated. And that's something we could do with existing data in eMERGE that, that we just haven't done yet. Um, low frequency variant analysis. So, Certainly within the, the realm of the PGRN-seq, where we have specifically targeted a lot of rare variants by doing sequencing, um, even within the imputed data, we have a lot of low-frequency variants. In, in many association studies, people tend to do a, a minor allele frequency filter and only look at common variants. I think we have the opportunity that we could look at, at rare variants and consider doing the um, burden-based analysis of rare variants, you know, bin rare variants based on different functional characteristics, you know, gene or regulatory regions, et cetera, and, and analyze the data in that way. We've only recently started exploring gene-gene and gene-environment interactions. This is something that in the field we're seeing more and more of. Um, people have been saying and suggesting that interactions may be important, but because sample size has been limited, there hasn't been statistical power to find interactions. Um, in eMERGE, we have actually published um, a few uh, from the Marshfield project looking at gene-gene um, interactions in cataracts. Um, we've also done gene-gene gene interactions in lipid levels. And very recently, we've started doing some um, gene-environment interactions as well. Um, the gene-gene interactions that we're finding for cataract are actually replicating across the network. So these were discovered in, Emer er, in Marshfield and then replicated in the other sites. Um, so I think this is something that, that we should be pushing more of. And, and I've started collaborating with CHOP on some of their interaction analyses, and I think we're going to bring some of those to the rest of the network. Um, pathway analysis has become much more popular in the field, and integrating functional data from ENCODE 
to help target regions of the genome to look at and get away from this protein coding region emphasis, especially when looking at kind of polygenic or interaction models. Um, integrating other epidemiologic data, you know, a lot of these uh, academic medical centers are positioned in areas of the country where vast epidemiologic data is being collected by other units. There's a lot of uh, GIS data, there's air pollution data, there are things about heavy metals that, you know, the CDC and other epidemiologic units are collecting. We could integrate that information with the data we have from the EMR and use that towards better gene environment analyses um, that I think would be, would be really useful. Um, and then we've also talked some about other molecular data, and I won't spend much time on this because this is something that Debbie is going to talk more about, but, you know, I think there's a lot we can do with the existing data in eMERGE without generating more data, but of course if we had the opportunity to generate more data, either um, RNA-seq methylation, more sequence data, more targeted high-throughput genotyping platforms, um, considering, you know, especially if we started considering RNA-seq or methylation, we would really need to consider different tissues rather than just uh, DNA from blood. But if we added those data to what we have molecularly in the GWAS and imputed data in eMERGE, as well as the PGR and seq data, um, it would add, you know, great opportunities for discovery to couple with the the wealth of information that we have in the EHR that, that we just haven't really mined to its full capacity. Um, so to, to summarize, um, I think you know, we as a group think that there's a lot more discovery that can be done, be done in eMERGE, um, and as part of eMERGE 3, these discoveries can be made either by performing much more comprehensive analyses with the data that we already have, and I think that we'll see a lot more of that in this last year and a half of the network as it stands now, because it took us quite a while to get the data imputed and clean, um, as there, there really was not a, a, a literature out there to look at for how you merge data sets that have been imputed. Everyone's been so focused on meta-analysis, um, and so we really had to kind of pave the way on how to do this. Um, and so we're actually writing that up now as part of a, a special topic in Frontiers in Genetics, um, so that other groups that are interested in doing more of a mega-analysis instead of a meta-analysis would, would know the lessons that we've learned in eMERGE. And if we perform more data generation via sequencing or other technologies, of course that would allow us even greater um, opportunity to do more discoveries in eMERGE. Um, I think, you know, we as a group should try to incorporate more types of data, such as data from the environment, um, or, and at the very least, considering uh, you know, multiple phenotypes or subphenotypes within the EHR, and, and some of the groups have been working toward this end, but I think in eMERGE 3 it, it could certainly benefit us to um, allow for the methodologic approaches to analyze these types of data. You know, they're needed and they're critical to really push some of this forward. Um, I think, you know, some methods are out there and some of us within eMERGE are working in that space, but in order to really capitalize on the data that we have in front of us, uh, I think bringing in you know, new ideas is, is going to be to our benefit. And I will stop there. Okay, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, we'll pass the gavel to Debbie Nickerson as uh, the reactor. I was just hoping I wouldn't push the wrong button. I think I need to get off of here. Is that all right? Is that better? Yeah, it's fine. Is that better? Yes. It, it's certainly audible. And we have your slides up. Okay. So um, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Are you? No, we're hearing you clearly. All right. So it's just me. Um, in thinking about eMERGE 3 and reacting, I certainly don't want to think that sequence is the only way. I just wanted to bring it up because eMERGE 2 is moving into sequencing. And um, I think that there's uh, a lot of reasons to think about sequencing in the future. And it brings together all the phases of eMERGE. I can have the second slide. 
I mean, from applying sequencing on a large scale, and error was certainly a big part of this, everyone has uh, highlighted the, the fact that there is an extensive amount of rare variation in the human genome. And if you go to the next slide, uh, most of the variation in the genome is rare. Um, and if you go to the next slide beyond this, what I've done is I've uh, logged the minor allele frequency, and if you just advance, um, Brandy, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm highlighting 1%, which um, most GWAS chips with imputation will capture. And you can see that's just one part of the picture of natural variation in the population. If you advance again, you can see that there's a, a large fraction that we're not capturing. So my, I think everyone is interested in, in running the gamut of allele frequencies across the population. So if you advance to the next slide, if you look at deleterious alleles, and there's lots of ways to look at this, uh, you can look at it by loss of function, uh, splice variants, as eMERGE is doing, and you can also look at applying every predictive method that you have. There's more than seven, more than ten of these, but if you look at uh, rare alleles in the population that are predicted by a large number of methods, those alleles that are predicted by all to be del deleterious uh, are very young. This is the age of, of the mutation in the population. So smaller is younger. And so these are uh, alleles that also uh, we would like to get at. If you get advanced to the next slide, uh, Emerge 2 is certainly uh, getting at that uh, through a collaboration with the PGRN uh, by applying a, a targeted based sequencing platform that has been developed by that group. And the genes that are covered there by looking at extensive data, although individual variants may be very rare in the population. If you add up their frequency, uh, just the rare variants, uh, uh, it's, it's suggested that 7 to 12 percent of the population may carry a rare variant that's unique to the individual, but across the population is very important for phenotype. So looking at these questions of the overlap or the in-between uh, for rare and common is very interesting and important question. So if you go to the next slide. So the case for sequence sequencing is uh, obviously, uh, the majority of variants is rare, but it can be collectively common. The most impactful are not only rare, but also young in ancestry, maybe even family specific. Uh, when we talk about family history, is there some way to bring families into the study? And that's just the concept. And, and I think that sequencing is the perfect segue uh, from merge one and two into three. And just to to uh, state that sequencing is not the only way, but but also looking at expanding the data set uh, to a 
across the genome will be very important. And if you advance to the next slide, uh, it interfaces with large projects like ENCODE that has given us new knowledge about uh, um, non-coding variation and where it's present in regulatory regions within the genome. And if you go to the next slide, um, uh, this is just a slide that I stole from a colleague, John Stamp, uh, that uh, um, his graduate student, uh, uh, Matt Morano, actually looked at the intersection between GWAS hits and DNA sensitivity sites and found that there was an enrichment of GWAS hits in these areas. And I know this is an area that ENCODE is very interested, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Emerge is very interested in the intersection of, of these non-coding variants and, and where they overlap with Emerge sites. Um, if you go to the next slide, there are uh, external groups interested in, in mining electronic medical records, and this is just an example that was in cell in the past year where 110,000 uh, 110, medical records were looked at for connections, and they found a connection between associations and Mendelian diseases. And it's um, intriguing to think about how Mendelian disease variants may interact to contribute to common complex diseases or traits. We've known in cancer for many years that uh, underlying susceptibilities in specific genes provide the first hit. Is this true for other diseases beyond cancer, like cardiovascular disease? Uh, diabetes, et cetera, uh, uh, sequencing would enable us the ability to look at this. If you go to the next slide, uh, there are also great interest in reporting incidental findings from sequencing and, and obviously recommendations uh, have been put forward about the genes that you would want to look at in this regard. And that's an important, uh, uh, certainly something very important for Emerge to look at. So uh, if you advance to the next slide. Uh, so uh, sequencing would allow us to explore the spectrum of actual variants in the sequence. And also at the same time, will uh, permit the intersection uh, of rare and common, the contribution of rare, perhaps Mendelian, because many of those actual genes are related to Mendelian diseases. Uh, how do these contribute to common diseases is, is an important question. If you go to the next slide. Um, so the idea of sequencing and talking about sequencing, whether it's selected targets like the pharmacogenetics uh, panel or the return of results targets or exome sequencing. I mean, genome seems perfect. Uh, the price is dropping. We're hearing $1,000. Uh, it's coding plus non-coding. Uh, which extends into some of the areas of interest for mining uh, for uh, the GWAS studies. And then in terms of looking at the phenotype, I, I just want to end with uh, what was been most successful in applying sequencing in some of the large-scale sequence-based a consortium I've been a part of. And if you advance to the next slide, and that's really, oops, uh, skip the slide. Okay, so uh, 
So you go to the next slide. This slide, this is it. Okay, so sequencing the tails of the distribution. Uh, I think that phenotype and mining phenotype the way you've done in Emerge is perfectly suited for finding uh, the best types of phenotypes to think about sequencing. And the outcomes that have been positive from the large-scale application of sequencing has been looking at the extremes of a trait. Anytime we really went to an extreme, and I'm talking about using like an emerge-sized uh, record-based, like 100,000, and picking out the extreme tails there, Obviously, you also find mistakes out there, which Emerge is very familiar with. But you can get down to the most important set. And I think that Josh uh, Denny talked a little bit about that with Stevens-Johnson syndrome and the fact that you, uh, if you can get down to that uh, a small handful of individuals, uh, sequencing would have uh, of also, in addition to finding the location, you can do it by GWAS, but you can also get to the functional variance by sequencing. And so just to give an example of this, we'll ask you to wrap up. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. Uh, uh, if you take an example of high and low LDL, if you go to the next slide. Um, if you look at the distribution of variance by these little triangles, at the tails of the distribution, uh, at the high level of LDL as a trait, LDLR had a burden of rare variants uh, in the population. This is expected from Mendelian. Uh, hypercholesterolemia is, is pretty common in, in the population, estimated at 1%. But also, at the tail of low, pesky 9 actually fell out. Uh, it was, there was a burden, but also a more common, rare variant uh, that was present. And this was sequencing hundreds of individuals, not thousands. So uh, if you vest uh, I think there's a discussion, and Steve Leader is going to take it from here. Okay. Well, Steve, if you're there, we'll, we'll segue immediately to you. Um, I am here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Um, in retrospect, I guess I, I should have. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? In retrospect, if I had to use a smaller font like Howard did, we could get these all at, on one slide and look at them at the same time. Um, but they're broken up into two slides. On this first one, um, I think uh, you should get the sense um, by now from both Marilyn and um, Debbie's presentations that uh, uh, the consensus of, uh, of uh, our group was that discovery research should remain a, um, a high priority for the uh, future. And uh, working with the phenotyping group, uh, uh, one step is obviously to decide what traits or phenotypes uh, are uh, sort of high priority for the next phase of, uh, uh, of the network. And then the topic for discussion, and, um, and some of this has been occurring in the um, um, sort of uh, online chat, is um, uh, you know, whether or not uh, just go with existing data and uh, uh, work with uh, uh, improving the analytical tools and the methodology um, to use existing data, or um, uh, whether there should also be some effort into um, denser data generation, whether it's by next-gen sequencing or, um, or uh, exon arrays. Um, as a sort of a non-genomic uh, person pursuing this more from a pharmacal uh, perspective, uh, I, I guess we could also add in that uh, the existing data could also include the uh, longitudinal phenotypes that uh, several people have alluded to. 
uh, and using this in the context of uh, you know the genetic contribution to disease progression. This also lends itself uh, at uh, gene environment interactions as well. Also, the impact of therapeutic interventions on uh, on the trajectory of, uh, of progression. The, uh, the second part, point that came out of our uh, discussions was uh, this whole issue of, uh, of uh, not uh, uh, throwing the, uh, the baby out with the bathwater and looking at the importance of, uh, of uh, rare variants. And again, uh, up for discussion would be the uh, most appropriate uh, uh, platforms, whether it be a genotyping or a sequencing platform to capture them, but also um, resources that may need to be put into developing appropriate tools to detect their effects. Is that the next slide? So this is um, this next point gets at uh, one of Debbie's uh, last points, and that is uh, uh, considering study designs other than a, a straight uh, GWAS type uh, format for discovery purposes. And uh, for example, uh, Example that she gave, looking at discordant, um, uh, extreme discordant phenotypes, at least for uh, uh, continuous variables, um, and coupling them with your uh, uh, platform of interest. And I've put uh, whole genome uh, sequencing here, and uh, you know the potential for this uh, particular approach to be a little bit more efficient in uh, in identifying uh, causal variants and especially uh, rare causal variants. And then the last point that uh, our group would uh, propose to the larger group at whole would be, uh, again, something that was mentioned by both Marilyn and Debbie, and that is uh, looking at other sources of genomic material, um, uh, RNA, or going back into the DNA and looking at uh, uh, methylation, for example, for these uh, uh, genomic analysis. And then on the um, EMR side of things, uh, looking to see how uh, additional data can be captured or parsed to uh, look at uh, environmental factors and comorbidities or uh, uh, gene by environment interactions, for example. So those are the four um, um, issues that were raised by our group as uh, um, being something to, uh, to uh, pose to the rest of the group for, uh, for their thoughts and comments. And I'll toss it back to the chair. Okay, the, the floor is open for comments or, or questions uh, on uh, EMR and genomic discovery. Uh, Mark Williams here. Um, in, uh, I, I, a thought occurred to me as Debbie was talking, um, again, trying to bridge the uh, tension that we have between discovery and implementation. And this was in the context of the rare variants. I think one of the issues that we're all going to be dealing with as we uh, receive um, secondary findings from our um, uh, genomes, exomes, and high-density chips about, um, you know, that we're thinking about clinically returning is the uh, lack of information that we have on the um, uh, uh, impact clinically of some of these rare variants, even in genes that we know quite well. Um, one of the things that will be doing is to try and use our traditional methods of contextualizing that data using family history and other sorts of things to understand what's the potential impact. To me, that seems that uh, to lend itself to the idea that if we did a rare variant focus, we could study how we could use electronic health record mining to try and contextualize rare variant information to add additional information for clinical return and implementation. So that could be a potential um, a study topic for uh, eMERGE 3 that would bridge, again, this discovery and implementation um, uh, chasm. This is Dennis Roden. Uh, I have to say Roden now because there's other Dan on the phone. Uh, um, I agree with Mark, but uh, at, a, at a practical level, I, I think you have to make some attempt to limit the minor allele frequencies down to which you're willing to go. If you find a rare variant that is one in a million or one in a hundred thousand, uh, it's going to be very, very tough unless you know something about the biology to assign any kind of phenotype to that. And so I, I, I think the, the sweet spot for us is probably minor allele frequencies around 0.1 percent plus 
variants in disease genes that are, you know, have been implicated. And as Zach said a couple of hours ago, uh, you find that variants that have been implicated as causes of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or channelopathies are actually much more common uh, than you give them credit when you start to look across very large populations, and we're finding that along with everyone else. So, so I think that, that uh, one thought is, is, is exactly which rare variants you would want to focus on. And I think that the variant of uncertain significance, this 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 1,000, something that emerge is really, really well suited to attack. You know, if we're capturing sequence data, it seems to me that we should report all variants, even if we only see it once in 100,000 people, and put it in a database because other people are going to be putting that data forward and annotating those variants, even if we can't determine ourselves alone if they're pathogenic, it's going to be really important going forward. I think, so, Gail, I totally agree with that, uh, and, and that's what we're going to be doing in Emerge PGX. And, and, and as, the, as, as data accumulate worldwide, you can start to make some sense of that. But I think over the next five years, uh, it's it, a one in a million variant, unless there's some biology around it, it's going to be hard to make sense of. But we, yeah, I totally agree that we have to figure out a way of archiving this worldwide. So this is uh, Haukun here. Uh, so, <clears throat> as you know, the, um, the new platform from Illumina on the X10, uh, uh, which is currently tailored towards whole genome, I mean, it's very likely going to be adapted to exome, uh, even though that will probably take some time. Uh, but an exome could probably be sequenced for about $100, <clears throat> uh, sort of, uh, say, a year, year and a half from now. So in the interim, a strategy to sort of customize a chip uh, uh, with this rare variant content, particularly content that are sort of uh, um, uh, with potential or putative damaging impact or loss of function variants and so forth. And that can actually be typed now extremely cost efficiently across, uh, you know, uh, dozens of thousands of samples for a relatively uh, uh, sort of uh, low amount of money, even though it's going to cost some money. So, so in the interim, that would potentially be a very, very powerful strategy across all the sites because that would open up the rare variant content for all the phenotypes that we have, and we don't have that uh, today. So I w this is John Harley, Cincinnati. I just asked the question that when we concentrate on rare variants and we don't have all of our samples genotype, we rely on imputation. And as the frequency of the variant drops, the accuracy of the imputation is disastrous. And so how do we, you know, we don't, we aren't able to take advantage of our huge numbers because the error introduced by imputation is so big. Is there anybody that has a solution to this problem? You need to sequence. Yeah. 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 Right. That'd be great. Right. So, so this is Rex. I'd like to weigh in. I, I, I'd really like to endorse the idea of uh, thinking about environmental factors. We've played a little bit around with um, GIS tools. And I, and I think you know one of the things that we could do very well, which isn't done very well in most cases, is given the longitudinal nature of the people that uh, we're following, is to think about some of these environmental factors. I think there's going to be increased opportunities to capture some of these bits of data. Uh, Marilyn talked a little bit about uh, environmental protection agency think measurements that are being made. So I, I think to be able to start to tackle um, gene environment interactions using GIS approaches and some of these um, environmental measures is, is also something that would uniquely be uh, possible in an eMERGE 3 for, for us to take a look at. Well, this is Chris, and I, while I, I find that idea elegant, I, I, I want to make sure we're somewhat cautious and, and thoughtful about this. For some populations, and, and your Chicago population, Rex, might be a, a superb candidate for this. For other populations, they're not always, as we say, population-based, and hence the density of sample cases in any environmental geocode you, you run into power problems very quickly uh, with environmental association, particularly when you're treating it as a covariate and a substrate. Chris, this is Marilyn Ritchie. One of the other things that, that I think folks could think about 
And, and this is something that Marshfield has done in Emerge 2, and that is to use the Phoenix Toolkit as a mechanism to collect environmental data. Um, we were awarded a, a supplement as part of the Phoenix Rising program by NHGRI, and so um, some of the Phoenix Toolkit measures were sent out to the Emerge participants. And we've actually started mining that data, and we're finding really interesting gene environment results for type 2 diabetes and some for cataract, and we only implemented a few of the Phoenix Toolkit measures. Um, that's something that, that other sites could do either electronically or paper forms. You know, it's something that you could port to an iPad that people could do in clinics. You could put it on the web that people could do through their My Health at Geisinger or Vanderbilt or what have you. Um, and that's another way that even without relying on population-based environmental data, you could collect it on the participants in the biobank. Well, I, I certainly agree that would be hugely more efficient and wouldn't, wouldn't suffer the, you know, broad association problem that you have with geocoding. Uh, <coughs> and I actually think the Phoenix Toolkits would be the appropriate choice for, for collecting that kind. So I agree with that, Merle. That's a good point. That, that might be another um, agenda item to put on the discussion with um, large health system providers when they're discussing it with, um, with uh, the vendors of health records because the patient portal is going to become a part of a, um, the man, uh, mandated um, electronic medical records eventually. And as they're building them, it would be nice to have patients uploading uh, various lifestyle things that can be merged with their electronic medical record. This is Terry. So um, one question is there, are there other things that the coordinating center should be working on in the future? I mean, they did an awful lot of work with data cleaning and then the imp uh, imputation, but are there other things that would make the data set more effective for other analyses that would be a good focus for eMERGE 3? So one focus there, this is how CON is, is um, on the copy number variation analysis because uh, that's another whole dimension that, uh, uh, you know, focusing there from the rare variant standpoint, because most of the data is typed on Illumina, uh, that can open up a, 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 a very fruitful sort of uh, uh, discovery uh, focus across all the um, phenotypes, again, uh, from a data mining uh, standpoint. And, uh, and algorithms can, you know, we have algorithms that can be applied uh, uh, on uh, uh, these data at the individual sites or 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 uh, jointly, and then the whole thing just sort of uh, uh, meta-analyzed together. Yeah, this is Terry. I I did want to ask about the the issue of sequencing. When when we've approached approached sort of large-scale sequencers, um, the the question they often ask is, well, how many cases of a given disease do you have? Because um, they're very interested in looking at, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of cases of disease X. And, and that has not been something that Emerge has, has really focused on because we're sort of phenomic, as it, as it were. So, so how do we address that question um, other than say, gee, we've got so many wonderful phenotypes, isn't this just as good or better? So Gail, you... Uh, so I, I think we don't need to have a disease focus. I'd be really excited to sequence the 56 ACMG genes. Um, we know what those genes do, but we don't know what the variants in those genes do. And we could look both for variant annotation, pathogenic, and importantly, not pathogenic. Everybody's going to have sequence variants. It's a matter of what they do. Um, and then we could also look for pleiotropic effects of those same genes. So there's a discovery possibility there, too. And then there's lots of implementation questions. How do you, you know, let me tell you, my health system is very concerned about those 56 genes now because of the ACMG recommendations. Um, so how do you implement that? How do you give decision support? How do you educate providers? What do patients want to know? What do they need to see? You know, I think it really hits all the things that we can do really well. And having those phenotypes um, that we have so in such depth gives us a unique resource for, for that kind of annotation. And I think even at the pediatric sites, there is really important work. That, you know, 49, I think out of the 56, have pediatric phenotypes. Um, plus, the pediatric sites really could look into this idea of mandatory return of adult onset findings to children, which has been a hugely controversial recommendation. They could really ask their families, what do they want? Ask their providers what they want. So I think that that is a space where there's a lot of controversy, a lot of interest for the health system, 
and we have a really unique capability. And I don't think Steve Huskins says these six things. I would add a couple more, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's doable. I, I I agree with Gail. I think that there. No, this, no, is I, urban, I, this is urban. I, I, that one could add to such a panel, I think, which would be extremely meaningful and uh, something that can be done uniquely in Emerge. Things like uh, uh, a list of the highly penetrant uh, uh, forms of diabetes, highly penetrant monogenic forms of diabetes, and others. I think, which you know, it would be very helpful to understand uh, among sort of common complex diseases what forms are diagnosable on a, on a molecular level and uh, to what extent is that, to how frequent that is. So, so I'd be interested in, in Steve Leder and, and uh, Debbie Nickerson's comments on, on that. Let me just, just ask, you, both of you had, had pointed toward non-coding variation and, and here we're talking about really focusing on, on genes even though there are some non-coding regions obviously in, in the intron. So Steve or, or Debbie, any thoughts? Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's great to, to look broadly at genes, um, but I think that different platforms have different uh, outcomes in terms of what you'd look at. I mean, many people are sequencing a whole genome, but they end up looking at only the coding and, and that few percent that are well annotated by ENCODE uh, as being highly functional. But I, you know, I think broadly whole genome is an important route to go because you can look at variants that are difficult to look at like indels and CMVs by just sheer capture. Thanks. Steve, what, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, non-coding for me really uh, points more to um, um, regulatory regions uh, as being of interest. Uh, but you have to understand I'm coming at this from a, a pediatric perspective uh, uh, as well, in that uh, when we are looking when we are looking at things in kids, there's so much um, change that is going on between birth and and uh, sort of adulthood that uh, you know you have to look somewhere somewhere besides the coding region of the uh, of a gene for for what's changing as kids grow and develop. And uh, you know to some extent, um, we we know very little about. Um, how this really works in uh, senescing adults as well as we move towards uh, um, a geriatric population. So for me, the, the non the non coding stuff really uh, I, I'm I'm really thinking about uh, uh, important regulatory regions and being able to identify those and and characterize them. Steve, this is Dick Winchelbaum. In all of our studies of variation in cancer drug response the majority of the hits that are functionally important regulate transcription. They're a non-coding region. So, so this, is, this is very brilliant. Um, I, I think that it's, it's clear that from an economic standpoint, we can't do whole genome sequencing of 50,000 people. And, 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 but, but we could, uh, we could look at, 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 at a smaller number of genes. And since these genes have been, you know, implicated in, in human disease, they're reportable, they're actionable. We can look both at exomes and, and introns. I, I think that if we focused on, on a subset, su subset of genes, uh, you know, it, it would be a paradigm for, for looking at the whole genome. I mean, it, it just, it, it would be scalable. And I think that, you know, there's the 50-some genes here. Maybe you know all of us have some other favorite genes. If we if we had a hundred genes, it's kind of catchy. Instead of thousand genomes, we have a hundred genes that are looked at in in, in across a, a large number of people. And and again, this would be as a as a parodying, What what are we going to do uh, when we have a large number of whole whole genome sequences? It, this this really. Uh, cuts across all of that. I, I would point out that's very reminiscent of the decision early on with the ENCODE project to tackle 1%. I mean, I don't know if I like this idea or not. That's a separate issue. Sure, sure. But it is reminiscent that the same rationale went in and we can't we ever going to interpret the whole human genome. 
so there was a whole process to pick the 1%, which was highly complicated, but we got there. Everybody studied the 1% until you felt comfortable enough to scale up to the whole genome. Mm -hmm. So this would be, be a, a similar circumstance, it, have, it, however many genes you pick. I think we could also emphasize diversity here. So you have a specific set of genes that um, there's a particular interest in reporting results back, but also possibly data for minority populations. Right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we could do really well in that avenue. So, so is the idea to do non-coding as well, right, of those genes? Yes. Well, I think if you could sense. find that, yeah. So if you know the regulatory reasons of them. Sure. Well, well, I'm going to clarify. Yeah. That. I mean, would you, what, you, you would take a gene and you would just go end-to-end, -end, maybe X number of bases upstream and downstream and just do the whole segment? Yeah, I mean, as opposed to known, I mean, what Terry was implying was sort of known functional non-coding well, regions. I would, I'm just uh, trying to stimulate the conversation maybe towards exome versus uh, targeted panel. So what's the difference there? If you get exome really cheap. What's the difference? Uh, I mean, it's not even clockwise or it's technical. These are actually apples and oranges. Yeah. These are actually asking very different questions. You're making, if you're only going to go exomes, you're going to make the assumption that that's what you're going to find. Yeah. And anyway, I thought the idea was that you have these types of genes that are of interest, and it's on the various of the encoding, some of the non-coding, so and you want to get a complete inventory deep in lots of people. Yeah. That's deep. what I wanted you to say, Eric. Yeah. I don't know what I'm <laughs> I was just trying to rearticulate what I thought I heard. So it was not, but what I, what I also heard was a variant approach, which was you take the X, you take X number of genes and you take all the exons, but then you take... Well, or any introns. Any introns. Any regulatory right. regions you know it's, of. Yeah. Well, and the introns or well, else. And this regulatory else, oh, else. No. to the extent you knew them. Okay. Yeah. Well, no one you know, I mean, I mean, there are some that have regulatory regions that are identified in other chromosomes, you know, and so maybe mm -hmm. look at those as they become, you know, added in. But, you know, it takes two years, Debbie, or, or more to develop a targeted platform like this? No, I think it's much easier now than it was. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't think it's, I think we have a lot more experience. And I think yeah. the PGRN has great data with the PGXC. Uh, they could look at these questions. Debbie, what do you think of molecular inversion from versus the next gen? You know, I think it's a matter of cost and uh, cost and ease of implementation. I think some can be cheap, but uh, whether they're broadly applicable to many genes is not known. Mm -hmm. If we we'll put, give this to the if we put this into into an RFA, <laughs> I, I, would I would suggest that uh, we, we could be agnostic, agnostic as to the technique and let the um, people that are putting in proposals uh, discuss how they would do it. Because as was pointed out, there are a number of us that are going to be generating large numbers of exomes and genomes. And so that would also allow then for a, a methodologic comparison about what's the best way to actually do it. Okay, uh, and we're going to need to wrap up the discussion at Iftikhar here. Just a very good point that um, there are these uh, uh, commercial um, uh, entities that are trying to uh, make these panels of two or 3,000 genes so that if you have a patient with Marfan or if you have a patient with hypertrophic, you just order that set and then you can just pick and choose and analyze because what's happening is that, you know, we're realizing that there are many variants that may cause, for example, an aneurysm. And so I end up ordering a panel of 15 candidate genes, which is like $5,000, and I may still not get the information because they may just do st certain variants or not. So I think, you know, that's another, you know, it's not in the whole exome, but it's like what are the 1,000 or 100 or 1,500 genes that are most often used in the clinical setting and perhaps go with those. And also it would go back to Debbie's point that if you're using some of these in the clinical setting, you would have the familiar structure to interpret the variants much more efficiently. Okay, so I'd like to thank all of the participants for actually all of our panels this morning um, for a very rich and uh, thoughtful discussion for future directions in eMERGE. And we're going to, I guess we're down to uh, about a 20-minute break uh, for lunch. Be so, careful because you're not going to get all these people down to the cafeteria, through the cafeteria, back up here in 20 minutes. We'll do our best. Uh, so we'll, we'll plan to start uh, somewhere around... Uh,
half past the hour. Um, the idea is these folks should get their Yeah, lunch everybody out there uh, yeah, on the call should go run for lunch and bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> on the first floor here, you come up.